very much, Len. Great pleasure to be here, and I'm honored to give this lecture. And if I just show you this image to kick off with, this here is a rheumatoid joint imaged with a thing called 2 deoxyglucose. Now, the first thing is, what, you know, why would a thing called 2 deoxyglucose, a strange sugar, light up a joint like that, like a Christmas tree, you know? And that's the teaser for the whole talk. I'm going to explain why this is happening and why this might be important. And this could have all kinds of consequences for diagnosis, for early arthritis, for example, for new therapies to manipulate this very strange metabolic phenomenon happening in rheumatoid. And of course, our cancer colleagues were the first, it's actually fluoro, the oxidose, FDG, you may be familiar with that. That was first used for tumors. But now it's working anywhere there's inflammation, it light up like a tumor. And the question is, why is that? What does that mean? That's gonna, I'm going to address that as we go through the talk. And I'm going to do three things for you. Um, I'm going to really give you a sort of philosophical thing. You know, where, where have we come from? I mean, I've been in this business now for 28 years, which seems like a very short time. I did my PhD in the 80s. And what, what have those 28 years taught us? Let's speculate on that, all that effort for a minute. Has it been worthwhile? Secondly, where are we? Have new therapies emerged from all that effort? And then where are we going? And this rediscovered front, the one I'm picking is the one my own lab has entered. This met metabolism business is, is one place where we all might be going. And let's go back. Where, where have we come from? Let's look at a little 28-year perspective. I'm going to go back even further than, than, than 28 years ago because a maiden aunt of mine died, a maiden aunt, strangely, at the age of 88, about a year ago. And among our book collection, I found this book. It's called The Modern Family Doctor. It was on our bookshelf. You know, her, her parents must have owned this book. And it was published in 1914. And I got that book before my siblings robbed her house of all the things that she hadn't left them. Um, and I, <laughs> I, I brought that book home and looked up rheumatoid arthritis. Now, in 1914, if you were diagnosed, the term was used then, rheumatoid. If you'd, if you'd rheumatoid, what would they do to you, these wonderful physicians? And charge you 50 guineas, probably, for the privilege. Um, look at this. The diet ought to be as rich as can be digested. Consider amounts of meat, good sound wine or stout, excellent. Extracts of malt was the first thing. The best drug, no fancy biologics. The best drug was syrup of iodide of iron, whatever the hell that is. And then it says, look at this, sea sand should be heated in a tin and poured over the affected joint as hot as can be born. And it makes the point, not regular sand, sea sand. And that must seem to be important. But look at this. Another method which frequently does wonders, this is 1914 now, consists in the application of large blisters over the spine, these blisters being kept open for a week or 10 days. It's usual to give some opiate, I'll bet it is, <laughs> during the cure, but the results are so gratifying in many cases as to warrant a trial, even in seemingly hopeless cases. I mean, it was horrific, wasn't it? They, they were torturing people. I wonder if we, if we fast forward 100 years from now, we'll be now saying, hang on a minute, you actually cut people with, with scalpels and you gave them these very strange drugs? I mean, maybe in the future we'll have even better treatments than we have today. But again, it serves the purpose of thinking this was hopeless, really. And of course, what changed was all this wonderful research. And of course, basic research is under threat in the US. No government or seem to want to fund it anymore. They're all morons, I think, because any advance comes from basic research. And Sarkozy said this famously. He made a great speech about four years ago. He said, without basic research, there can be no applications. After all, electricity and the electric light bulb were not invented by incremental improvements in the candle. You know, so you can't go from that to that, you know, by incremental improvement. We might say, you know, uh, there was no anti-TNF. You know, it wasn't invented by incremental improvements on aspirin, was it? I mean, aspirin's the... To go from that to that, this is Enbrel. Uh, it took a huge amount of research. All these wonderful experiments were done over the course of, what, 50, 60 years. You know, DNA had to be discovered. Everything had to happen to go from this to this, and this is the big impact. So again, the importance of this research is critical. And if I go back 28 years, in 85, when I began my PhD, this was rheumatoid arthritis in a way. Um, the big noise were prostaglandins, you know, driving inflammation. And I've, I've often had this domino effect that what starts at the end up with an inflammatory disease here. And prostaglandins were very... Uh, trendy in those days, of course. And then rapid progress, you know, by 1990, of course, the cytokines come along, IL-1, TNF, IL-6, many cytokines are found. We understand more about gene expression changes, and again, we get inflammation as a result. So that, that discovery of cytokines was a key step in this process. And then, of course, signaling was my area for many years, NF-kappa-B, P38, the JAKs are discovered, all these genes change, you know. And again, more and more complexity and more and more cytokines. We learn more about dendritic cells, of course, and T cell interactions begin to be understood. Of course, a huge advance was the discovery of these innate immune receptors uh, that won the Nobel Prize in 2011 for Hoffman and Beutler, and of course, Ralph Steinman for the DC. And that was a big step up because these, these receptors drive the cytokine process, you know, and they're very early in the, in the whole event. And of course, what they're sensing are these so-called damps, the danger 
patterns and the PAMPs from microbes are being sensed by these innate receptors. And that propels the whole thing forward. So in many ways, all we've been doing is figuring out what, figuring out what these dominoes are and track them down and try and understand them in various ways. And then today, we would add, of course, things like the microbiome. And the next speaker, I think, is going to talk about that. That's become very uh, interesting. And these regulatory T cells, the whole suppression of this pathway, T regs, has emerged. So many discoveries get made, and many processes are found. And of course, the question is, what about therapies? And of course, the wonderful advance, as you all know, are cytokines. Because the blocking of cytokines has made a huge difference, as you know. And just to announce, um, I am the president of the International Cytokine Society. There's no need to applaud that, Joe. It's all right. But we have merged with the Interferon Society. It's like the Arabs and the Israelis coming together. It took 10 years of negotiation. And we got one new society. It's called the International Cytokine and Interference, ICIS. And we're having our first meeting in September. You're all welcome to come to that. We're now joining forces. And I was in the Cytokine Society since the mid-'80s. And that's where these discoveries were first. I remember the first time I heard about TNF was there. And the first time that a, a TNF inhibitor was described there, or anti-IL-1. And this is a very important society. And all these findings are made. And of course, the cytokine world then is really awful. Because when I began, there was only two or three interleukins. You know. Now we have hundreds of them, it seems. And a recent review on this that's quite informative in, um, in trends in immunology divides them. There's the yin and the yang, if you like. And the yang are the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And they come out of different, of course, the wonderful advances in the different uh, cell subsets. TH17s are found, you know, TH1, the T, you know, follicular T cells, M1 macrophages. All these make a set of cytokines that are very pro-inflammatory. And then on the other hand, the yin side, things like Tregs, and Th2 cells, they make anti-inflammatory cytokines, and they're more in immune regulation, and they are involved in repair. So there's a real split between the two types of cytokines. Some are pro-inflammatory, and some are more based around repair and anti-inflammatory, and they're coming from these, these specific different cell types. Now, this here is actually quite a complicated version of the cytokine network. Here's a simpler one from the same review. I mean, it's ridiculous, you know. <laughs> How anybody can make sense of this? There are, I think, 11 cytokines here and nine transcription factors interacting in this awful mess. Um, now, the good news is, of course, as you know, therapies are, are tested and they work. I mean, it's surprising that such a complex network would respond to a single monotherapy, and yet it did. And you all know this, the biologics clearly, anti-TNF, anti-IL-1 to some extent, anti-IL-6 receptor, as you know. And it, rheumatoid is the first place they went with these in many ways. There's five of these anti-TNFs, as you know. In psoriasis, a new one is uh, anti-P40, which blocks the IL-12, IL-23 cytokine. That's approved in, in psoriasis now. In Crohn's, they're trying the same again. I mean, drug companies lack imagination. They try the other diseases. Anti-IL-6 receptor and anti-TNF is working in Crohn's. Lots of phase three efficacy. I mean, there's no question. Things like Crohn's and colitis are responding to anti-IL-17, for instance, in colitis. So, so we are seeing these wonderful clinical outputs from all this effort. That's a real thrill to make sure that these findings are relevant. In the clinic, that's where it gets proven, and it's great. And the second thing, then, is all this work that was done by biochemists and cell bi biologists on signaling. I mean, we discover all these kinases and, and so on. Not a single drug came out of that yet except, of course, the JAK inhibitors. And as you know, tofacitinib, it's Pfizer's drug, uh, is now approved in the US for rheumatoid. It was turned down in Europe about two weeks ago, strangely, which is interesting, the two different agencies. Uh, EU said, no, no, we don't like this one. You know, the evidence isn't great and the side effects. It's approved in the US mainly for the methotrexate non-responders. Um, but of course, this is a signal being blocked, and that's, that's the next frontier in some ways. Can we use our knowledge of these signaling pathways to design small molecules that could be as efficacious as biologics? And that's, that's going to be a very important development, I think. And, and this is the first one, and there will be others. Now, so today, if we go back, um, these innate receptors, let's re-emphasize, they, they are really important for the whole process, for driving everything. And, and the discovery within that was extremely important, and my lab was involved in some of this. And as you hopefully know, things like the toe-like receptors get discovered, and they're very relevant for rheumatoid, and this kind of summarizes uh, our current view of this. And, and what happens here is the, these receptors will respond to pathogens, of course, things like LPS from gram negatives, but equally, there's enough evidence now for us to be happy with the idea of these danger signals, damaged tissue, release uh, products that get sensed by these uh, innate receptors. And in rheumatoid, all of these are candidate ligands. I mean, you have things like tenacin C, you've got fibronectin, some of the HSPs, biglycan, hyaluronic acid fragments, fibrinogen. And these are all, of course, our breakdown products of connective tissue, really. And there's good evidence that somehow they trigger inflammation through these innate receptors. Uh, one good example is fibrinogen. Because if you citronellate that, and of course citronellation is a very important area for rheumatology, it increases the activity tenfold towards TOL4, and that's quite good because that makes sense in a way. And TOL4 then will drive your favorite cytokines. And our own work, we've done stuff on TLR2, and this was done with Doug Veal 
uh, in St. Vincent's in Dublin. Uh, we, have, we have a blocker of toll too. It's called OPN305. Uh, it binds toll two and neutralizes it. And we tested it in rheumatoid because there was evidence of toll two in rheumatoid. And this was Doug's system of ex vivo biopsies. And you can, they'll make IL-6, they'll make TNF. And putting in our antibody very effectively reduced that cytokine production in that tissue. About 50% inhibition, I guess. Um, and that would give us evidence that TOL2 is overactive as well in the rheumatoid context. So we're pretty comfortable then with the notion that these innate receptors are sensing this damage. And in the case of a joint, it'll be a connective tissue product. And then driving cytokines. And then if you intervene and block these, that could have utility again. If you like, you're going a step up towards an earlier domino in the domino effect process. And the second thing about this is the tolls were very important, of course. They were the first to be discovered of these innate receptors. A second family are the inflammasomes, and that's really given rise to a huge amount of excitement. And these are a subset of innate receptors, and they drive IL-1 production. And of course, IL-1, kicking around for, what, 40 years now, IL-1 is driven by these so-called inflammasomes. There are four of them that we know a lot about, um, and they all drive IL-1. I mean, the strange thing is they all converge on caspase 1, and they form these multi-protein complexes, and then somehow activate caspase 1. NLRP1, they're called NLRs, NLRP1 mainly senses bacterial products. Uh, NLRC4, again, mainly bacterial products. And, and AIM2 senses DNA. And of course, DNA sensing is a very exciting area for autoimmunity because um, aberrant sensing of nucleic acids is a big part of that. The one that gives rise to most excitement, though, is this one, NLRP3. That will sense a whole range of PAMPs from various bacteria and viruses. And secondly, very importantly, again, these danger signals from damaged tissue, things like uric acid. Uh, beta amyloid, all of those are somehow sensed by NLRP3, and that then drives IL-1 production. And that discovery by Jörg Chop of, of the inflammasome really galvanized many of us around this system to understand what was going on. And what I think is very nice about this is it, 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 mutations are then found, as, as you probably know, in some of these inflammasome components that give rise to auto-inflammatory diseases. And that allows you then to configure all inflammatory diseases in one slide, if you like, as to whether they're auto-inflammatory or autoimmune. And, and up at the top here, we've got classic autoimmune diseases. These ones are mutations in genes that control regulatory T cells. IPEX is a key uh, FOXP3 regulator. So, so if you get a dysfunctional T reg population, which are normally suppressing inflammation, you get autoimmune disease. And then down the other extreme, these fevers, where you see these mutations, like Muckle Wells is a classic example. That's an NLRP3 mutation, and that drives autoimmunity. L less, less involvement of T cells here or B cells. And of course, gout is here as well, down this end of the spectrum. Rheumatoid's in the middle, of course, because uh, it has features of both. Uh, lupus is up this end, and things like type 1 diabetes, obviously an autoimmune disease that's organ-specific. So, so the more systemic ones are over here. And again, it's useful, this, I think, to classify diseases based on autoimmunity or autoinflammation. And that gives us extra insight into disease pathogenesis, I guess. And who would have thought that this would be found? I mean, Muckle Wells is very rare. Um, it's an NLRP3 mutation, which overactivates the NLRP3 inflammasome driving IL-1, a single injection of an anti-IL-1-beta antibody effectively cures these patients for three months. And here we see they get a skin rash, they get iritis. Single injection, you know, SAA goes to zero, and it persists. Uh, CRP, a classic inflammatory mark, again goes to, and look at this, within a day, the skin is clear and the eyes are clear. And that's because it's quite a simple disease at one level. But remember, it's a multi-organ systemic inflammatory disease. Who would have thought IL-1 was the key to all of that? Block IL-1, the disease goes away. Now, it's a bit simple because it's a single mutation. But even still, I mean, one day, if we fast forward 100 years, rheumatoid will look like this, maybe, if we understand enough about it. So in other words, these discoveries really can have a huge impact. And this saves these people's lives. I mean, people died of muckle wells. Doctors gave them steroids and colchicine and everything, you know. And yet, blocking IL-1 works very effectively in that disease. And, and, and then if you look at NLRP3 more generally, um, these are all the mutations, if you like, these hereditary fevers, because they, they get fevers as a key. Real FMF is in here. And there are all mutations in this. But equally, um, all these particles, these so-called uh, frustrated phagocytosis happens. Uric acid is here, of course. Silica, cholesterol crystals, um, and Alzheimer's beta amyloid. All of these are sensed by NALP3 somehow, and that drives IL-1 production. So in a way, this is the key sort of um, sensor of many different things, I suppose, that drives IL-1, and that gives us new insights. And I think what's exciting about this is, um, probably it, it, for this audience, it could be particularly relevant for the arthropathies that involve crystals, of course. Um, and the best data so far will be hydroxyapatite crystals are somehow sensed by this inflammasome. And what's happening is this inflammasome is sensing sort of phagocytose material. 
and it can't digest it, and then it makes IL-1 as, as a danger signal to deal with this insult, this noxious substance. And, and uh, uh, these crystals are a great example of this. There's, uh, the role in gout is less clear, because the NLRP3 knockout isn't especially protected. But blocking IL-1 is turning out to be very efficacious in gout. So IL-1 is still involved, but the this particular inflammasome mightn't be key. And Alex So has done great work on this. And this was a trial they published, I think, a year and a half ago, where giving gout patients anti-IL-1, in this case, an antibody. This is the Novartis antibody. Um, it's called canakinumab. And when I first heard that, I thought the guy was saying, can I kill you, man? <laughs> Which is not a good name for a drug, is it? But anyway, if you give these, um, here we see, look at this. This is pain and, and joint swelling. Look, they're very severe in the patients. Give them canakinumab, and look at this. The pain goes away, and very less numbers have severe. And within seven days, look at that, they're all back to normal. No pain, no swelling. So, so there's no question this is going to be a wonderful add-on, approved in Europe for treatment of gout, of course. And then in the case of osteo, I mean, the best evidence, I suppose, so far for this inflammasome is in osteo. And this is Richard Flavel's paper, where he showed these hydroxyapatite crystals, especially the ones that were more needle and rod-like, and these were taken from uh, osteo patients, will drive IL-1 very strongly. Uh, the, the more smaller crystals won't, and this is this frustrated phagocytosis idea. And then very important is the model of osteo here involves... Um, a, a protein called ANC, and if you knock out ANC in these mice, you get very severe cartilage degradation, and the, the NAL3 knockouts are protected from that cartilage destruction in that model of osteo. And again, showing that, this is the hydroxyapatite dependent model, uh, showing that NALP3 is key for this. And getting back to my domino effect, which I use uh, relentlessly, you could say this is osteoarthritis in a way, if it is driven by these crystals, that NALP3 senses them, and then we get IL-1, we get our signals, we get COX-2 agrokinases, joint inflammation, and OA might be the result. So again, the discovery of this part of the process then is extremely important, I think, because it gives us a good go now at pathogenesis of these diseases. Now, the last bit then is, what will happen next? So the discovery of the inflammasomes, these innate receptors, they're very early tile in the domino effect, great. You know, what might happen next? And we have stumbled into this area by accident, and I'm calling it the rediscovered frontier, because you go back 50, 60 years, people knew a lot of what I'm going to tell you already, um, and all we're doing is fitting in the, the, the detail, I suppose, the molecular detail, and it's this metabolic business, the role of metabolism in innate immunity and inflammation. And I'm very excited about what we're getting here and some of the data we're generating, and I might convince you now to do your own research in this area. And how we got into this was reluctantly, we were working on type 2 diabetes. It begins with type 2 diabetes. And we had, um, you know, as you know, there's an epidemic of diabetes happening in the US and everywhere because of obesity. And it's a really important area, type 2, because kids have it now. You know, the numbers are going through the roof. There's all these comorbidities. And as you know, obesity is the big risk factor. And this is a good way of to look at the US over the course of 20 years where obesity goes up precipitously over that time. And type 2 diabetes correlates with that very nicely. There's no second pointer, Len, is this, this pointer is beginning to... It's, it's running out of juice because of the uh, uric acid buildup. Um, now, you've got to love America. A friend of mine sent me this photograph. Look at this. Childhood obesity, don't take it like you. And underneath is an ad for McDonald's. <laughs> it's brilliant. A friend of mine sent me this. It was from a website called Friends of Irony. And it was ironic photographs. And he sent me another one, which is irrelevant now to the talk, but it's one of my favorite slides as a joke I've seen a long time. He said, there's a better one than this in America. For some reason, America has lots of slides involving irony, or <laughs> ironic things happen in the US more. And he sent me this one, look at this, look. So evenings at seven in the parish hall, look at this. So on Monday, it's Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Uh, Tuesday, it's abused spouses. Wednesday, eating disorders. Thursday, say no to drugs. Friday, it's a bit like working at the Cleveland Clinic. This is a support group you have for your staff association. Um, Friday, teen suicide watch. Saturday, soup kitchen. But Sunday, America's joyous future. <laughs> so you can't beat irony, can you, in this situation? No. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll move on from that now. So, 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 um, so a long time ago, it was realized IL-1 was important in type 2 diabetes. And in fact, this was done like 25 years ago, where low levels of IL-1 were OK. They were good for you. Beta cell proliferation would happen. It's come back. Um, appetite suppression. When IL-1 went up, the beta cells began to die, and then insulin resistance began to emerge. That was first shown 25 years ago. And, and that was a miss. Why would IL-1 be? Remember, IL-1, it's a fever-causing cytokine. It's made during infection. What's it doing in diabetes was the thing that everybody puzzled about. And then very important, there are nine separate clinical trials now showing efficacy with blocking IL-1 in type 2 diabetes. And many of the diabetologists believe blocking IL-1 is going to work in type 2 diabetes to stop this 
sort of thing. And you don't want to block it completely. You want to get it down to this level. You know, and, and that's really important to lower it. And, of course, the question is, what induces IL-1? We wondered about three years ago, what's driving IL-1 here? Because it seems like strange. I mean, there's no infection here. You know, normally infection would drive it. Maybe there's a mutation in some of these things. We wondered what was driving it. And we turned to this substance. It's called IAPP. It's an amyloid-type protein. I guess laid down in the pancreas of type 2 diabetics. 90% of diabetics overproduce this. And it, it forms amyloid in the pancreas. And of course, this struck me as a classic inflammasome activator. As I mentioned, the NALP3 inflammasome is sensing particles and trying to phagocytose them. So we turned to this, and it was great because this turned out to be a really good inflammasome activator. And here we see some data. Here's IAPP driving IL-1. Here's the knockout and, and completely gone. So all of the IL-1 that IAPP drives is NLRP3 dependent. And that was good. We'd found a key component in this process. And then maybe, I suppose about, this, about a year and a half ago, this was two years ago, um, three or four papers begin to appear saying the same thing, which is nice, and expanding it a bit into other tissues. And of course, the obesity link, it, it looks like this. So normally it starts in the uh, uh, fat tissue, probably, with various noxious lipids build up like palmitate and ceramide. Macrophages go in there. They sense those noxious lipids with their inflammasome, now 3 drives IL-1. You begin to get resistance to insulin, begins to emerge. You begin to get decreased fat oxidation as well. Uh, and then the pancreas starts to make more insulin. And IAPP is a normal uh, hormone. It's made with insulin. It sort of facilitates insulin action. The macrophage, uh, that begins to get deposited because it starts to get overproduced. The macrophage goes in. And again, now 3 again senses that, makes IL-1, and then we get more resistance and we get beta cell death. So it's, it was possible then to go back to my domino thing, to fill in the gaps again. And IAPP could be a key driver here. Now 3 senses it, IL-1 gets made. In this case, we get resistance to insulin, we get beta cell death and type 2 diabetes. So again, it places these factors as being very important in this disease. But of course, what we wondered was, struck me. Why would inflammation cause insulin resistance? It seemed peculiar, you know. Like you might think you want to soup up the insulin system if you're inflamed to get more glucose to be burned or whatever. And it does. It's been known for a long time. When someone has an infection and they're a type 2 diabetic, they take more insulin because they know that inflammatory event is causing this resistance. Here he comes. Thanks very much. Insulin resistance. And of course, this could be the reason. It's, I, I came up with this idea. And then, of course, you discovered it was said 30 years ago anyway by someone else. Um, but it's probably as follows. So, so normally, insulin allows glucose to be used by muscle and liver. That, that's the main place insulin does its job, allows glucose to be burned there. In the case of inflammation, the macrophage does not become resistant to insulin. It's got a separate glucose transporter and just doesn't really consider insulin. And so glucose will now build up because of this resistance. And now the macrophage has a prodigious appetite for glucose. Starts to burn it, becomes activated, does its job, of course. You know, you get host defense and repair. And therefore, the reason for the resistance then is to allow macrophages to burn more glucose for their job. And that seemed to be a good reason as to why inflammation would cause resistance. Now, this would happen normally during infection. But remember, in type 2 diabetics, it's chronic. And so you get this chronic resistant phenomenon happening. And of course, that struck me then what role, so, so if glucose is so important here, what role is it playing? in this IL-1 beta system because macrophages are making IL-1. And, you know, we then did this experiment next. So, so we blocked glucose use in a macrophage with something called 2-deoxyglucose. Remember what I mentioned at the very start. So 2-deoxyglucose will stop glycolysis. Immediately there's fear in the room when I use the word glycolysis. Um, but 2-DG blocks glycolysis. And look what it does to macrophages. It completely blocks IL-1. So here's LPS driving IL-1. This is transcription. Of, it's not the inflammasome. It's actually induction of the, uh, the gene here. This has been a message. 2DG blocks that very nicely and doesn't block TNF. And that's a very important difference because that tells us it's not just some metabolic poison. And when we got that result, we suddenly said there's something in this. And let's follow this up. And the rest of the talk, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what happened next because it gets very, very complicated. But that, that single um, result tells us that the macrophage burns glucose to make IL-1. And it needs to burn glucose through glycolysis because 2DG blocks glycolysis. And for some reason, TNF doesn't involve this process at all which could be very important. And um, went in vivo, gave mice 2DG, gave them LPS, again blocked IL-1 very nicely, didn't block IL-6 as a kind of a control here, again, to show that it's not just killing the animals. So again, it works in vivo if you block glycolysis uh, with 2DG block IL-1 production. And look at this. I mean, this is quite a simple thing. There is glucose, as you'll all remember from your chemistry lectures 30 years ago. Uh, 2DG just lacks an oxygen, you know, and yet that becomes completely anti-inflammatory if you like, and that one's pro-inflammatory. So that simple change seems to make all the difference. And this actually, this phenomenon is called the Warburg effect. Because what's happening here is 
LPS on a macrophage changes the, ma the metabolism in that macrophage towards glycolysis. It starts to burn glucose through glycolysis. And anybody who works on these things will notice an activated macrophage. The medium will always go yellow over time with LPS, say, or other things will do this. Um, and it's going yellow because of lactate, because lactate comes off glycolysis. And you can block that with 2DG very nicely. And this is the classic so-called Warburg effect. And what you can measure this. This is using um, a machine called a seahorse. It can measure glycolysis and oxfos, the other thing that happens to, to glucose metabolism. And a big increase in glycolysis with LPS at the expense of oxidative phosphorylation. So this is the Warburg effect defined bioenergetically. Um, and very interestingly, and this is going to become important, a particular coenzyme called NAD goes down. So here's NAD levels in the in, in, in LPS causes NAD levels to collapse. And I'll be back to that in a minute. Just try to keep an eye on that one. And this is the Warburg effect. And I gave this talk recently, and um, the guy after me said, what's the O'Neill effect? <laughs> I think he was being rather sarcastic. Uh, wouldn't it be great to have an effect named after you, though? You know, whatever. But there he, there's Warburg. He was a German biochemist. And this is what he described. And what the strange thing is, he, he only described this in tumors. This Warburg effect happens in tumors. And what Warburg spotted was, normally oxygen levels are high in systems. Glucose is burned through the mitochondria, as you may remember, through oxfos to make ATP. Under anaerobic conditions, it can't do this anymore, and it switches into glycolysis, and you get lactate. And that's anaerobic glycolysis. That's normally what happens. In tumors, uh, Warburg spotted there's normal oxygen, but for some reason, it, it ignores the mitochondria to some extent and burns the glucose into lactate. And that's called aerobic glycolysis. And that was shown in tumors. It was also shown in tissue that proliferates a lot. And this is the exact phenomenon happening in macrophages when you add LPS. And that intrigued me, the fact that an activated macrophage would have a metabolism just like a tumor cell. And Warburg was so famous, I've looked, looked him up his biography a bit. He was so famous in the 1930s, his grant application was a single line, I require 10,000 marks. You know. Now, the NIH could learn a thing or two there, couldn't they? You know? <laughs> um, and then we wrote this review uh, about a year ago, I guess, uh, or maybe, yeah, last year, on this whole thing. Because you know, I said, look, the, the NLRP3 inflammasome is important for, for diabetes. Did Warburg miss inflammation? Because all he spoke about was tumors. And I said, look, you must have missed inflammation, that the inflammatory macrophage would have the same metabolism as a tumor. And then a German postdoc of mine found a paper from 1958 <laughs> called Stoffwechsel der Weissen Blutzellen. And I said, oh no, Warburg did actually, this is white blood cell metabolism. I said, he did, he did describe it in white blood cells. And then she, she went, oh no, she, he didn't. And then she translated the paper for me. And in fact, he got it wrong. He said, the cancer metabolism of normal white blood cells is an artifact of mechanical and chemical damage. He missed it, basically. He was actually activating macrophages, but he thought it was an artifact of the system. And he said they don't have this metabolism. And indeed, they do, because all he was doing here was activating macrophages. So macrophages do indeed have this strange metabolism. And then the, the strange thing is we, we kind of talk about this in, in our paper. One of our initial papers came out. And suddenly, this wave begins to grow. And two papers appear, one in JX Med and one in Cell, on the same thing in TH17 cells, the same metabolism. And this paper by Doug Green and Hongbo Chi showed that TH17 cells have this Warburg, this glycolysis, this pathway. And it involves HIF, very importantly. I'll back to that in a minute. And what, was, what got me on this paper was very striking. Here are TH17s. You can turn them into Tregs. So there's FOXP3 staining. It's low in the TH17. It's high in the Treg. You can do that by giving them 2-deoxyglucose. That sugar will convert the phenotype of the T helper cell. And of course, T cell plasticity is the holy grail of immunology. They work on it to death, these immunologists. A simple sugar can convert the phenotype of the T cell from a TH17, which is pro-inflammatory, into a Treg. And even more nice, this is a model of, e of MS, EAE it's called. Um, that's a TH17 model. You can block EAE with 2DG as well. So again, blocking this Warburg metabolism, and HIF is the key thing, it turns out, for this process, will actually have an anti-inflammatory effect. And then we did this review about two months ago in Nature uh, on this area, uh, a metabolism of inflammation, and it's limited by, I think, called AMP kinase, and this pseudo-starvation, back to that a little bit later, because this, this review, if you really can't sleep at night, uh, get this, it's 10 pages long on metabolism. Um, but it was good nature asked us because the, the, the editors figured, oh, this is a good area now, it's emerging. And in this review, I, I show this table, which looks very complicated, it's quite simple. It turns out that you can now phenotype an inflammatory cell based on its metabolism, okay? So an M1 macrophage, that inflammatory macrophage, has glycolysis, this pentose phosphate pathway, various markers of that, you know, you get HIF1 alphas there, and you get a pro-inflammatory phenotype, right? The M2 macrophage is the opposite, it's got oxfos. 
very different metabolism, and that's anti-inflammatory. And look at this. A TA17 has glycolysis, and that's pro-inflammatory. A Treg has oxfos. And the tumor has identical metabolism to an M1 macrophage. Glycolysis, HIF is here. You know, in this case, you get a tumor. So this struck me as very interesting, that the, 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 the function of the cell could be determined by its metabolism. And to make it a bit simpler, all the inflammatory cells have Warburg, this, this strange glycolysis, M1s. DCs, fibroblasts, all the anti-inflammatories have oxfos, M2s, Tregs, and memory cells, and the T cell people are doing lots on this. Memory T cells are oxfos. They, they switch to Warburg to become activated. So very interesting. And back to my uh, earlier slide of the yin and the yang, you can simplify that now, because all of these cells here, the inflammatory ones, the yang side of glycolysis, and all the anti-inflammatory are oxfos. So you get this huge division in metabolism. Now this is all very well, but what does it mean? Now, I then, for you people, especially today, I dug into the literature on this. And of course, this was shown in 1956 in the rheumatoid synovium by, by John Dingle. Uh, I, I did my postdoc at a place called Strange Ways in Cambridge, and John was the director. 1956. And look at this, like, like the, the activity in human synovial lining cells in rheumatoid. So the rheumatoid synovial cell has Warburg, just like uh, the activated macrophage. And even more interesting, I think, I, this, you're probably aware of this, I mean, I knew this myself. Several autoantigens in rheumatoid are enzymes in glycolysis. So glucose, phosphate isomerase, enolase, aldolase. All of these can be autoantigens. And enolase is one of the big citronellated proteins. You know? And again, that's interesting, that the, these glycolytic enzymes they're driving this metabolic flux, but they also could be autoantigens. And, and what that would mean, of course, we don't know, but it's still of interest. And of course, what's happened here, metabolism is meeting immunology. It's a horrific thought. And when I've given this talk to an immunology audience, they all get extremely nervous. Because most immunologists did immunology to avoid biochemistry. Um, <laughs> and, and it's happening. And, and in fact, the two systems aren't that different, actually. Because infection injury, you know, you get inflammation. You get uh, a restoration homeostasis. Nutrition, it's all about external stressors in a way. In this case, nutrition gets metabolized to maintain homeostasis. So the two systems aren't that different. And of course, it's this crosstalk between the two that's becoming more and more evident. And if you look at disease, I mean, in the case of type 2 diabetes, overnutrition will give rise to a change in metabolism, and that will drive inflammation. So the arrow can go to this way. And then secondly, of course, perhaps, uh, as we're going to show, the inflammatory process through infection, maybe genetics as well, but the inflammasome will alter metabolism and could give rise to disease. So I think the interface between these is becoming more and more question, uh, of interest. But for me as a real molecular biologist, a lot of that's waffle, you know, these arrows, you know. What are the precise molecular pathways that link the two systems? That's what we have to crack now. That's our mission is can we figure out what is at that interface between those two pathways? And we've got one. I've given you one already. In the case of type 2 diabetes, the overnutrition gives rise to an alteration in metabolism. That would be buildup of fatty acids, say, or you know, ceramides and these things. And look at NALP3 senses that IL-1-beta. So we have a molecular link here to this disease, very importantly. And one that just came out, really interesting this now, just came out in Nature Immunology by Shizuo Akira, a key figure for tolls, of course. He wondered, why does colchicine work in gout? You could start this paper. It's a very complicated paper. And it turns out that colchicine works in gout because it destabilizes tubulin, probably, this cytoskeletal element. And what Akira showed was, amazingly, these metabolic stressors, things like uric acid, but equally tolls, I think, will lower NAD. Remember I mentioned this magical thing, NAD, earlier? NAD goes down, and there's a deacetylase. It's a sirtuin called SIRT2, and you may have heard of sirtuins. They're deacetylases, very important for aging. SIRT2 deacetylates tubulin, and it needs NAD. NAD is a cofactor for these deacetylases. And when NAD levels fall, SIRT2 is turned off, and tubulin acetylation persists, and it turns out acetylated tubulin is needed to assemble the inflammasome. And what colchicine does, it destabilizes tubulin. And what NAD does is it activates SIR2 to deacetylate tubulin. So in many ways, a, a link here through NAD. And NAD is, of course, the metabolite that's of relevance here. And I've made it a, a bit simpler in this way. So you can imagine the, the inflammation is decreasing NAD as a readout, decrease SIR2. SIR2 is a deacetylase. Acetylated tubulin persists, and then that allows NAP3 activation, and we get IL-1. Again, a molecular link now between the metabolic process and uh, inflammation, and that, that's what we're trying to achieve here. And the second example I'm going to give, so, so that one in gout then, you know, the decrease in NAD might promote inflammasome activation. Um, that's one example. The second example is my own one. My own lab uh, made this discovery, and we just published it about two weeks ago. And succinate 
is the second molecular signal that links these, and that's the story I'm going to tell you. So we found another meta metabolite, if you like, uh, that links the, the metabolic process with inflammation. And again, interestingly, drive IL-1, and that's, that's the relevance here. And just to remind you how we got to this. So again, the question here is, how would you link these metabolic changes to, to, to inflammation? How we got to this was this observation I gave you about 10 minutes ago, 2-deoxyglucose suppressing IL-1, not affecting TNF. That result then propelled us into a series of experiments. And we asked two questions. So, OK, does this metabolic change is happening? And, and the model is macrophages with LPS, but it could be any, any innate receptor really activating macrophages. What would that mean for the macrophage? And what's the mechanism? And they're the two things that we then try to answer in these experiments. And again, what role does glucose play? As I mentioned, glucose metabolism seems to be key here, because if you block that with 2-DG, you suppress the IL-1. And then secondly, maybe we can treat inflammation by starving macrophages. If macrophages have this prodigious appetite for glucose, could we do that? And the third thing, I'm gonna, towards the end, I'm going to give you this. I think many anti-inflammatory drugs work by convincing a macrophage that it's starving, okay? that the macrophage is somehow deprived. And we've coined this term pseudo-starvation. They're not really starving, but they think they are because of these drugs. And I'm going to give you one very good example of that towards the end. So what we did next was, um, like, what do you do with this? You've got 2-DG blocking. You're quite happy with that. What happens next? Well, you've got to do metabolomics. I mean, it's, you've got to do some kind of omics these days, it seems. Um, and this actually tends to be quite useful. So LPS will drive glycolysis. Let's do the metabolome. And we went fishing. And very nicely then, we got a very simple diagram. Again, you're getting nervous. And I'll give you my own story here. So when I did biochemistry as an undergraduate, um, every year Krebs cycle came up on the exam. You know, And I decided, because I was lazy, I won't study Krebs. I'll do glycolysis. And guess what came up? Krebs. And I failed that paper. <laughs> so it's a bit ironic that I'm now talking about this. Um, but we did this metabolomic uh, screen. And, and we did this with the Broad at, in Harvard, MIT, Dr. Clary Klisch. And we got great results from this. We measured 790 metabolites by mass spec in an activated macrophage. And what was nice was we got the Warburg. All these ones in red go up. These are all glycolytic intermediates. They all go through the roof. Uh, all these, these, this is the pentose phosphate pathway. goes up hugely. And then very interestingly, certain TCA cycle intermediates. Some go up and some go down. The blue ones go down. One went up hugely. Succinate went up a lot, right? And that was just this fishing expedition. And secondly, we got evidence for a strange metabolic little cycle called the GABA shunt. And you can make succinate from glutamine through GABA, of all things. And that, that, that gets turned into succinate through the succinate semialdehyde. It's called the GABA shunt. And from this, basically, we found these metabolites, and they were changing. And succinate stood out. There's the GABA shunt again. So succinate went up a lot. And you can make succinate from glutamine, interestingly, through this GABA shunt process. And then we honed in on succinate. So very simply, we saw succinate go up. And we began measuring succinate. And then it went great. Whenever you make a discovery that's correct, you know, every experiment kind of falls out 90% of the time. They don't, of course. But we measure succinate. It goes up 50-fold in a macrophage. Here's LPS. On a 50-fold increase in succinate. Very nicely. Of all the metabolites, succinate went up. And 2-deoxyglucose will block that. So 2-DG is blocking that flux into succinate. Very important. And then with Clary, we tracked C13 glutamine. This was a tour de force. You can add C13 glutamine to cells and measure by mass spec. You can track the carbons. And these four carbons are all labeled. Uh, here we have the glutamine. Into glutamate, into alpha-KG. Some go through GABA and end up in succinate. So all the succinate carbons get labeled from glutamine. And that thing there, that's called the GABA shunt. And it's very strange, this. Because nobody's seen that before in macrophages. GABA, you would think, is a neurotransmitter anyway in the brain. And then we wondered, what does this so-called GABA shunt mean? And luckily, there's an inhibitor of the GABA shunt. It's a drug called Vigabatrin, which was used for epilepsy to increase GABA in the brain. And Because GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. We got some Vigabatrin. Nobody had ever tested Vigabatrin like this. And what did it do? It blocked IL-1 very nicely. And here we see Vigabatrin blocking IL-1 production. No effect on IL-6 or TNF again to show specificity. So blocking the GABA shunt then turns off this pathway. And even more compellingly, we did an LPS lethality model in mice as a way to have an in vivo thing. And it protected mice from sepsis, this drug Vigabatrin. Here's the mice dying normally. Give them Vigabatrin. Look at that. Big protection there compared to the uh, untreated. So you could repurpose this drug now, which is approved for epilepsy. You could repurpose this to treat sepsis because it's stopping this whole shunt. So at this stage, we had this it, it, sort of strange set of observations. Um, very novel, which was the good bit, I suppose, that LPS could increase glycolysis and this peculiar GABA shunt business and increase succinate. That's the important thing. But of course, unrelentingly, what would that succinate do was the question. 
And of course, what we'd seen was, very importantly, it's all transcriptional. So it's the IL-1 beta gene that's being blocked here. And we looked at the uh, IL-1 beta promoter, and you can block it with 2DG, this luciferase off the promoter, block with 2DG. And then, as I said to you, very importantly, a big difference was TNF was not inhibited. And the TNF promoter lacks um, various things that the, the IL-1-1 has, and HIF-1-alpha stood out. There's a HIF-1-alpha site in the IL-1 beta promoter. So we looked at HIF, and I remember HIF had been tied into the uh, into glycolysis already by other people. HIF is needed for the glycolytic flux. And lo and behold, LPS, well known to stabilize HIF. There's HIF stabilization with LPS. This is under normoxia, remember, not under hypoxia. HIF is normally driven by hypoxia, but you can also drive it under normoxia. And um, 2DG will block HIF, so there's HIF there. 2DG inhibits very nicely. Uh, as you would expect, block an IL-1 again, 2DG. And very interestingly, HIF, the HIF system also involves succinate. And um, as you may know, HIF, HIF is normally destabilized by hydroxylation through these hydroxylases, and it gets, it gets degraded. These hydroxylases uh, make succinate. It turns out that they're dioxygenases. And one of the oxygens comes from alpha ketoglutarate, and they make succinate. And this was shown by the cancer people. Succinate's a very effective negative feedback inhibitor of the hydroxylases and will stabilize HIF. Now remember, we have succinate going up. And I wondered, does this explain everything that succinate will stabilize HIF and drive IL-1? Because HIF is in the IL-1 gene and not TNF. And secondly, the alpha KG, the substrate, will antagonize succinate. And we were able to use that as a tool. So we wondered, was succinate involved in HIF? And of course it is. Nobody looked at the HIF site in the IL-1 gene before. So we, we made luciferase constructs and we could mutate the HIF site and you block induction of IL-1 promoter activity by um, mutating the HIF site. So we knew HIF was important. And this is a good result. If you add succinate to macrophages, you get a massive boost in IL-1. So here we see LPS driving IL-1. Succinate drives that very strongly. This thing, butyl malinate, it blocks succinate dehydrogenase, and that will allow succinate to accumulate in the macrophage, and that boosts IL-1 as well. So again, further evidence for succinate. And as I mentioned, succinate's this negative feedback inhibitor on the system. Alpha-KG will block that. And lo and behold, what does alpha-KG do? Alpha-KG blocks IL-1. So here's LPS driving IL-1. Alpha-KG blocks. This is HIF on the promoter. Uh, you buy chip, blocked by alpha-KG. And here's the alpha-KG block and HIF activation. Here's the control, blocked by alpha-KG very nicely. And all of that's very complicated, but it brings us to one conclusion. And that is this succinate is key to this, because succinate goes up through the GABA shunt. Uh, the succinate then stabilizes HIF, and HIF drives IL-1 and other proteins, not just IL-1. But what we discovered here was um, HIF activation under normoxia. It involves succinate. Normally, it's hypoxia that drives succinate. And what this was exciting was, it's yet another signal from mitochondria. So as you, who would have thought, like, a metabolite succinate made in the mitochondria comes out, activates HIF, and of course, the precedent cytochrome C, that shocked everybody, that this electron transport protein leaks out of mitochondria and drives apoptosis. So, you know, the mitochondria are the source of all this here, really, in many ways. And then secondly, it, it, succinate becomes more and more interesting. There's a receptor for succinate on dendritic cells. It's called GPR91. It synergizes with tolls. And thirdly, a very interesting thing, proteins undergo succinylation. It's yet another covalent modification. And in fact, we tested succinylation. And nobody ever done this before. It's a bit like phosphorylation. And LPS increases protein succinylation. Look at this. So here's succinate. This is the control here. Add LPS, increase succinylation with an antibody blocked by 2DG, blocks IL-1. You can measure it by mass spec. This is increased succinylation. We pulled down some of those uh, proteins, identified them. Um, and here we see 30 different proteins undergo succinylation, it turns out. Many are metabolic enzymes. We don't know what this means yet, but it certainly is a very interesting, yet another covalent modification during LPS signaling, just like phosphorylation is happening here. And in fact, how we got to it, there's another search you insert five, which desuccinylates, and that goes down with LPS. And that desuccinylase is uh, an important part of this study. And all that we know, succinylation is weird. There's like one paper on this, or two at most. But in the 80s, biochemists were succinylating proteins as a covalent modification in vitro, just as a reaction, you know. And it alters conformation of proteins. Here's lysozyme was used, of all things. And when it gets succinate, changes conformation. This is confirmation, that's a confirmation. Changes conformation. So we think this succinylation could be a very important um, way to modify protein function, I suppose. So in essence, then, the key finding is inflammation drives this metabolic change, glycolysis, succinate goes up, HIF is stabilized, and will drive the inflammatory process forward. And for a layout, again, getting back to my signals here, remember the gout example I gave, 
where, and again, my, my, my question here is, what, what's the molecular link between these things? The gout example I gave a few minutes ago, NAD goes down, SIRT2 goes down, tubulin is acylated, we get NLRP3 activation. Equally, in our system, we have succinate going up, and that's the molecular link. PhD is inhibited, increasing HIF, increased IL-1 and other genes, and inflammation. So again, this is linking a metabolic change to the inflammatory process in great molecular detail is the way to think of it. And for the lay audience, I usually show this. It's very challenging, all this, of course. Even for all of us, it's challenging. Um, a good analogy is the immune system. It's not just macrophages. Remember TA-17s, the rheumatoid synovial cell. I think the same thing's happening in those cells. So the immune system is like a turbocharged hybrid car, right? So when it's resting, it's the battery, it's electricity. That's oxfos. To activate, you turn to petrol, that's glycolysis. Okay, so you get a shift in metabolism, and then succinates coming off the uh, metabolism to turbocharge the engine from glutamine. And that's a good way to think of it. You need to soup up the whole system by having this um, change in the source of fuel, I suppose, is the way to think of it. Now, finally, um, could there be a therapeutic angle to this? It's interesting academically, I suppose, and scientifically. But could this mean something for drugs? And I think it will be very important, actually. And I'm going to give you this because, again, the level of excitement that we're getting from some of our data. There's no question. What 2-deoxyglucose does is it makes an activated macrophage think it's starving because it's blocking that glucose metabolism. Okay? Glucose is plentiful, but 2-DG stops that metabolism. And why would a starving macrophage be turned off? Well, as I mentioned, glucose gets metabolized rapidly by macrophages, resistance to insulin in the muscle and liver. If you drop glucose, you better shut off your macrophage quick because you want to spare the glucose now for the brain and various things. So, so macrophages that are starving get turned off. And the key sensor of this is an enzyme called AMP kinase. That will sense the glucose levels normally. And low glucose activates AMP kinase. And AMP kinase drives fat metabolism. So you switch your fuel source, and the mitochondria now begin to metabolize the fat. And in fact, this is conserved through evolution. Uh, yeast have this as well. And this is a very important slide, because if you're a brewer, in the case of yeast, um, when glucose levels are low, the AMP kinase in yeast has got SNF2, becomes activated. It'll switch to oxfos. Glycolysis goes down, and then we get tragically a decrease in ethanol. It's called the deoxic shift. Uh, in macrophages, same thing. Low glucose, AMP kinase, increased oxfos, decreased glycolysis, and now we have an anti-inflammatory effect. And that would happen in a macrophage uh, uh, as well as in a yeast. And, and the fact that it's conserved in evolution is very important. And what does, of course, this famous drug metformin do? Remember, metformin, used for type 2 diabetes, activates AMP kinase. And it is being used now, as you know, for diabetes. There's evidence of working in cancer. That was in the Daily Express a couple of weeks ago. And the reason it's working is it's changing this metabolism. No question. That's why it's working in both situations. And metformin chemically activates AMP kinase to stop glucose metabolism and allow fats to be burned. And we tried metformin in our system. And what does it do? Blocks IL-1. It behaves just like 2-deoxyglucose. And here's metformin suppressing IL-1. No effect on TNF. And I wonder then. Is metformin working in type 2 diabetes because it's stopping IL-1 production? That's a prospect, given the role of IL-1 there. And, and, and lo and behold, what is metformin in the TA-17s? I mean, same thing. It just came out, this paper. Uh, metformin down-regulates TA-17s and works in the classic collagen-induced arthritis. So metformin is preventing arthritis in animal models. And again, it's doing it by preventing this metabolic flux. Suppresses glycolysis, like 2-DG, boosts mitochondrial metabolism, and that then stops this HIF process from happening in, in some, some way or other. And, and not just metformin. It turns out salicylates, the famous drug of yore, also drive AMP kinase. So does methotrexate. Very interesting, I think. I bet you the way methotrexate works in rheumatoid is by activating AMP kinase and, and shutting down this metabolic profile, whereas veritrol, the famous red wine ingredient, all of those go through AMP kinase and will allow mit mitochondrial metabolism to happen and stop this Warburg effect, if you like, from happening. So basically, do anti-inflammatory drugs then, here's the question, cause this pseudo-starvation, because there there's plenty of glucose around, uh, and then turn off the macrophage, and that's a very interesting hypothesis, I think. And remember, succinate may be a very important signal, a driver of this process, and the take home then, uh, inflammation will drive this metabolic change, glycolysis, succinate, and HIF, and maybe pseudo-starvation limits this via AMP kinase. Now, of course, we don't exactly know how the AMP kinase process fits into this change. Figure that out, you know, so trying to find out what that is. But certainly, it will lower succinate and, and stop this flux, and that's something that we're trying, trying to address. And here's my last couple of slides. I think it's um, a way to tie it all together. You know, it's, it's, it's intriguing that inflammation is at the heart of most diseases, remember. You see inflammation everywhere, and it's probably because they're all metabolic diseases. They're putting the body under metabolic stress, inflammation. And it deprives tissue of nutrients, ignores the usual cues. Inflama remember, metabolism is tightly integrated, 
an inflamed rheumatoid joint ignores all those cues and starts burning, you know, burning aggressively, and then just like a tumor in many ways, and that will give rise to morbidity and shortening of lifespan. And, um, you know, as I said at the very start, it's no wonder then we can image rheumatoid joints with 2-deoxyglucose. Here was a study done very recently. This is a rheumatoid patient lighting up with 2-DG. This is, this is the synovium burning glucose through glycolysis, and we would suggest generating succinate. Here's the anchors. Give them infliximab, goes away, as you would predict. So again, I think it's highly relevant. And to finish, just to sort of put the whole thing together for you. I'm always a bit, little bit uh, unambitious. This is all of inflammation on a single slide. Um, and this is not too bad. I think this is reasonable. All these discoveries for the past 28 years allow us to have this slide. And I'm putting into it now this, these latest insights and the drugs that are out there. I mean, this slide is only true because of drugs working in the clinic, I hasten to add. That's the ultimate proof that any of this matters, is when you see a patient respond if you interfere with these processes. But let's imagine this is rheumatoid as an example. Uh, you know, it probably begins with some kind of infection. Uh, and the PAMPs are there and the antigens. The innate system told, you know, NLRP3, sense that PAMP. Drive NF kappa B, P38. We get all our favorite cytokines start coming out. They drive inflammation. And lo and behold, that will drive tissue injury, remember, because inflammation ultimately at the start of the process drives injury anyway. And then we get resolution. That tissue injury releases the damps, you know, the connective tissue products, the hyaluronic acids, the, the Versicam, the tenacin C, and autoantigens start coming out because of the injury. And lo and behold, the same receptor system is sensing those damps. A vicious cycle then begins to be triggered here. And obviously genetics is the key to it because that tips it into this. This happens during infection as well, remember. Um, why does it go on to the, why, why would rheumatoid emerge? Must be genetic basis of some kind dysregulating that cycle. Equally, the innate system triggers T and B cells very importantly. Um, and the T cells make even more cytokines. The B cells make autoantibodies. They drive inflammation through complement, of course. And again, another vicious cycle here with more genetics, I guess. And then look, we can interfere, of course. The anti-cytokine therapies work, of course. Not, they don't work fully, but they certainly slow this process down. Um, Avatacept takes out T cells. Rituximab takes out B cells. Here we have the JAK inhibitor taking out this arm by blocking this process, and T and B cells mainly, probably. Um, so these drugs will work, and they tell us this is, um, this is a reality clinically. And now we must superimpose on that the dreaded metabolism, and there's no question a massive metabolic shift is happening in response to these receptors. NAD goes down, as I mentioned, and that will activate the inflammasome through, um, through the NALP3 and the tubulin story I told you. And then our own story, succinate goes up. And that drives HIF, and HIF's a key part now of this whole process. And that metabolic change then feeds into this. And here's metformin and salicylates. They're targeting this metabolic shift. And that's why they're showing clinical efficacy, possibly, by changing metabolism. So I think these are just ideas now. I mean, you know, we, we can discuss them. I think there's a reasonable amount of data to support this model. And therefore, we must now integrate, terrifyingly, these metabolic signals as part of our model of innate immunity inflammation. And this will give rise to better diagnosis, I'll bet, and holy, you know, the holier than, than now kind of approach, uh, hopefully give rise to new drugs that will be used to, to modulate these pathways, possibly in combination. And that metabolic change then could well become part of our, uh, our, our, our range of drugs that we might have to use in the future. So I think it's very exciting to get into this. Still beginning it, I suppose, and still trying to understand it. And I'll finish on that and thank the people in my lab. Um, so you may have seen this slide. Uh, at the European Championships, uh, our country is being bailed out by the Germans. Did you know that? Angela Merkel writes a check every month to bail out the Irish. And these very clever Irish soccer fans went to the football, so Angela Merkel thinks we're at work. Um, and my lab got a hold of this poster, and there they are behind it. <laughs> and there's uh, two of the people, uh, Rebecca Call and Beth Kelly, were very important for this study. And then very importantly, uh, the lead postdoc, actually, on the whole thing was Gillian Tannehill, uh, helped by Eva Paulson and Annie Curtis. Seth Masters, uh, he was now in the WeHi, he began on IAPP. There's Beth again. Um, and then I collaborated. This, this was a very complicated project with lots of collaborators. Luckily, I could convince people by buying them a pint of Guinness to do these experiments for us. Uh, those mass spec and, and the metabolomic technology is very complex. And luckily enough, uh, Ramnick, Xavier, Clary Clish at the Broad helped us. Um, Cormac Taylor at UCD, he's a big HIF expert, helped us. Uh, Isle Gottlieb, he's the succinate. HIF guy and cancer, and he helped us with the whole succinate aspect because he was able to measure succinate for us. Uh, Phil Orland cloned the I1 beta gene uh, back in the, in, the, in, the, in the 80s. He helped us with the I1 beta promoter and looking at HIF there. And Mike Murphy is a key mitochondrial expert in Cambridge who gave us lots of advice because this is an area that I wasn't that uh, familiar with, so I'm very grateful to all them. And then finally, I'd like to thank Science Foundation Ireland and the European Research Council for financial support. Thanks very much. <laughs>